there were a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. These are mortgages that, you know, no documentation, don't have to prove your income, very non-credit worthy. But there was a there was a bubble mentality, a frenzy, and everyone, hey, buy a house and borrow money, fix it up, sell it for twice as much, walk away rich, you know, and everybody was doing it. Mortgage default rates rarely get above five percent. Five percent is really high in the mortgage market. So people were saying, you know, smart people like Ben Stein, the financial analyst, but the central bank and others were like, well, okay, let's get crazy. Let's assume a 20% default rate, which is which ne has never happened, but just assume that's true. On a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages, a 20% default rate would be a $200 billion loss, which was only slightly higher than the SNL crisis of the 1980s. You know, adjusted for inflation, it would have been a comparable loss. And the attitude was, well, we survived the 80s, we'll survive this. Yeah, it's bad, banks will take losses, stock prices go down a little bit, but we'll survive. What they missed is yes, there was $1 trillion of uh, subprime mortgages, but there were $6 trillion of derivatives. Yeah. That was invisible. So all of a sudden, 20% of that was $1.2 So you, you create derivatives out of thin air, yeah. uh, and there's no limit on how many you can have. They're off balance sheet, meaning give me the balance sheet of the company, I won't see them. You have to read the footnotes and then the, the information behind the footnotes. So non-transparent, unregulated, no limit on size. So the, the crisis was actually much worse than anyone realized. And then when it started to collapse, the, the, the contagion spread throughout the financial system. My point about 2008, it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998 and we flew right into 2008. But once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008 and we're gonna fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, the point is each crisis is bigger than the one before. The uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts. And are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, okay, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com complexity theory and capital markets, how that works. But where's the crisis coming from? What's going to be the catalyst? It's actually a long list. Now, student loans, there are $1.6 trillion worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis, you know, how does the how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into to debt and deficits? Uh, so when um, you know a lender, credit union, or anybody a university makes a loan to a student and the treasury uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults um, and the credit union, the lender simply turns to the treasury and says, here's, here's your loan file, pay me. And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. Uh, now it's on the treasury. But until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the Treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know, trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are, you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all, I can describe them. I can see how they're going to converge into, into a worse crisis, but in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why, but why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates of, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talk about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York, but she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt 
is their relative to the size of the economy. The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio. But mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade. How much debt divided by the size of the economy? So in a simple example, if you had uh, five trillion dollars of debt and a ten trillion dollar economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or fifty percent. Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yeah. That ratio is over 100%. We have round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105%, highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%, 200%. 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If you go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory. And he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so you proved that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation without causing high interest rates without causing a run on the bank so all we're saying is you know you did it to prop up jamie Dimon's bonus we wanted to do it to forgive student loans we may have we may have different policy objectives but the process is the same what's the problem now, of all the things I've debated, I've, for years I was de dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin, I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio, and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and the, the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory, you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand. And I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, buy a new car, buy a house, get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities. I no longer trust the Congress. Uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up. And the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold. There, as I say, land real estate, um, and natural resources, they're all, good, uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The, the, you know, the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All of these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly. And that's the problem with the theory. The inflation peaked around 9%, but it has been coming down. It's still too high. It's still way above the Fed's target. They say we want 2%, but I've never felt that 2% was the right target for inflation. I always thought it should be zero. If you believe in price stability, you wouldn't want any inflation and you wouldn't want any deflation. You would want price stability. Now, of course, you're never gonna get it exactly there, but the target in that world would be zero. Maybe a little bit below, a little bit above, but you'd always be steering to zero. That means you're not stealing anyone's money through inflation. You're not enriching creditors through deflation. You're not distorting the allocation of capital by either one. You're just saying we want stable money. That's kind of the Fed's job. Then the question is, why is it 2%? And you know, I disagree with Milton Friedman on a lot of things, but Milton Friedman said zero. He didn't think it should be 2%. He thought zero was the right number. I agree with that. So why is it 2%? Well, 
the Fed has a rationale. Um, the rationale is every now and then you have to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy, bail out the stock market. You just need a rate cut. And the evidence is pretty good that negative rates don't work. They have been tried for years in Japan, Switzerland, uh, I believe Sweden for a while, um, and, and the ECB, uh, but they don't do anything. They don't uh, stimulate. In fact, they often do the opposite of what they're intended to do. Let me give you a, a concrete example. So the idea is if I cut interest rates you know, lower and lower, as a saver or an investor, I'm going to say, well, I don't like those low yields. Um, you know, I put money in the bank, I only get you know, a quarter of 1% or half of 1% or whatever. So I'll go buy some treasury notes or I'll go buy some stocks. And that's called the portfolio channel effect. In other words, by keeping rates so low, you make simple savings and liquid investments unattractive and you drive investors to other investments, housing, stocks, bonds, whatever, commodities perhaps. And then that creates a wealth effect. And if my assets go up, I feel more prosperous. Maybe I spend more money and that helps the economy, et cetera, et cetera. That's the theory. It's all garbage, by the way. But there's, there's very little evidence for the wealth effect. I mean, yeah, assets go up, people feel a little better about it. But the idea that they turn around and spend more money does not hold up. Uh, the people with the most assets tend to have the most discretionary income. And, you know, once you got a couple of cars and a couple of houses, you know, and a, a decent wardrobe, you're actually going to go spend more money. Well, probably not. You'll probably save it or invest it. I'm not saying those are bad things, but the idea that it stimulates the economy is not true. But if you follow the theory and say, okay, lower rates force you into to asset purchases, et cetera, wouldn't negative rates do even more of that? Because what's what happens with a negative rate? You have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank and at a negative one percent interest rate, I take on the on the government or the treasury or the bank, I'm taking a thousand dollars a year. I'm taking one percent out of your account. So you're sitting there, you just say, Hey, I just want to save a hundred thousand dollars, that's all I want. But with a negative rate, it goes 99, 98, 97. And the idea there is, well, now you're really going to spend your money because it's kind of use it or lose it. Again, these are the kind of theories, but let me kind of ground that in the real world a little bit. What do people actually think? When they see negative rates, they, people say to themselves, huh, there must be deflation coming. You know, the economy must be in really bad shape. Deflation must be getting the upper hand. Why else would they go to negative rates if they weren't worried about deflation? And if they are worried about deflation, and they are, then I'm going to say more. We're far from getting people to spend, uh, remember the dollar is worth more in a deflationary world. Your dollars are actually worth more. In real terms, a dollar can be you know, just a bank account can be your best performing investment in a deflationary world. If if you have two percent deflation, then the real value of a, a savings account with zero interest goes up two percent, and that's probably better than what stocks are doing in that world. So people act rationally. They say, okay, we have negative rates. Central bank must be worried about deflation. If they're worried, I'm worried. And I'm going to say more because, first of all, those savings will do well in deflation. Uh, you know, I need, I need to be prepared for that. The last thing I want to do is spend. If prices are going down, why would I spend? I'll wait six months to get a cheaper price. So in other words, real world behavior is the exact opposite of what central bankers predict. Central bankers predict, use it or lose it, you'll go spend the money because I'm going to take it away. But real people say, no, I'm going to save more because you're signaling to me that the value of the money is going up because you're worried about deflation and prices are coming down. So what's the rush? So for all those reasons, negative rates don't work. Now, in theory, cutting rates from five to four to three to two down to zero does perhaps have some stimulative effect, not as much as people think. Uh, and so the Fed says, well, we don't want to start with zero. If we start with zero, if that's our target and negative doesn't work and the economy goes into a recession, how do we stimulate the economy? We can't go below zero, but we can't cut rates because we're at zero. So they believe that they ought to keep rates around 2%. That was inflation is about 2%. Interest rates are about 2%. And that gives you two points of cuts. You could do in 25 basis point rate cuts, you could do eight cuts. You know, it's a full year of rate cuts from you know, two to one and three quarters, one and a half, one and a quarter, et cetera. You can do eight 25 basis point rate cuts with 2%. So the Fed says our target rate is 2% because we need a little cushion in case we have to cut. And if we're at zero, we don't have a cushion, we can't cut. That's what they say. The reality is the following. Uh, and the way I explain this, it's like a little kid, like a nine-year-old kid, and his, his mother leaves her purse around, and the kid goes in the purse and sees there's $50 in the purse. 
And he says, well, even an eight-year-old say, well, if I steal the $50, mom's going to catch me and I'm going to be in trouble. But if I take a couple bucks, she won't notice. Like she's not counting the dollars every day. And the Fed's idea is if I steal 2% from you, you won't notice. 10%, yeah, you'll be up in arms. You'll be driving tractors up the steps of the Fed the way they did in 1980. But 2%, you kind of won't notice. Well, what's the math of 2%? Well, 2% cuts the value of the dollar in half in 35 years. It cuts it in half again in another 35 years. Bear in mind, you're starting from down half. So in a typical lifetime of 70 years, at 2%, the dollar is going to lose 75% of its purchasing power. So in 70 years, typical lifetime, your dollar loses 75% of its purchasing power at 2%. And that's really the point because 2% year in, year out, probably not enough to feel, but it's insidious. And by doing it for a long enough period of time, you destroy the purchasing power of the dollar. And that's what they really want to do. Why? Because the federal debt is nominal. The debt is nominal. If I owe you a dollar, I owe you a dollar. Whether in real terms, it's a dollar five or 95 cents, that's separate, but I owe you the buck. Well, if you can destroy the purchasing power of the dollar, you're actually reducing the real value of the debt. People say America has never defaulted on its debt. Well, first of all, that's not true. It's not a true statement. But the easiest, quietest, stealthiest way to default is inflation. It's like, hey, here's your billion dollars back. You know, good luck buying a loaf of bread because I destroyed the value of the dollar. Now, 3% will do it in about 23 years, which means that you'll destroy 75% of the purchasing power in 46 years, not 70 years. So on 4%, 5%, et cetera. At 10%, you cut the value of the dollar in half in seven years. People like to bang the table and say, you know, since since the creation of the Fed in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchase power. Well, that's a true statement, but you don't need 110 years. We lost 50% in five years between 1977 and 1982. So inflation is insidious. It is a tax. It is a form of theft. But like the kid with the mother's wallet, if you keep the theft, you know, in small little bites, but do it long enough, you can get the whole thing and no one will notice. So they say we want 2% because we want to be able to cut if we have to. But the real reason is we want to basically erode the value of the debt and erode the purchasing power of the dollar in ways that you don't notice. And, and they can be very patient. And that's how they do it. People hear the government say, you know, the economy's fine or, you know, unemployment's near an all-time low, you know, which is actually statistically is, is true. And they, they kind of nod and go, yeah, it's all good. And then reality is the stuff that hits you in the head like a two by four. You know, the propaganda is um, positive. We can talk about that in a little more detail. The reality is harsh um, and reality wins. Um, and there's a very good book um, on this um, by Robert Schiller, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist at Yale University. I'm not a huge fan of your garden variety PhD economist, but there are some good ones out there and he's one of them. He wrote a book about, oh, two years ago, maybe a little bit less called Narrative Economics. Uh, he said, yeah, we got all the models and uh, Phillips curve and uh, wealth effect and uh, uh, you know various you know, quantity theory money. And you know some have a place, some are more valuable than others. But uh, don't underestimate the power of a narrative. A narrative is a story. It's basically a, it's a fancy name for a story, but a story that, that persists, that grows. Uh, and interestingly, in epidemiology, of course, we've just come through a pandemic. There's a model called the SEIR model that stands for susceptible. Are you susceptible to a virus? E for exposed. Are you exposed to it? I, are you infected? Did you get it? And R, did you recover? Um, the difference between I and R are people who died. But it's it's a model and it's mathematically based and it's empirically validated of how viruses spread exponentially. And you can also use it to forecast how a virus is going to go. Well, what Schiller did, he took that model, moved it over to economics um, and took a narrative kind of like a virus, not in a negative sense, but just as something that spreads. And uh, it can be very powerful and then eventually may die out or reverse, but it can be powerful in the meantime. Um, that much I knew, but what I learned from the book that I hadn't really thought about is that narratives don't have to be true. They can be true and they can be very powerful, but a narrative can be false and still be powerful. If it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, if enough people believe it, it sort of becomes the reality to some extent, even if it's based on false premises. And he gives an example during the Great Depression. The Great Depression really was two technical recessions, but there was a period from 1929 to 1933, uh, three, 
election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then there was another period from 1933 to 1937. The 37 and 1940 part we leave aside for this purpose. But during the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are, have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of a depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Now, when FDR came along, 19, was elected in 1933, became president in 1934, uh, the psychology turned 180 degrees, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the Democratic campaign saw always happy days are here again, and you know, FDR seemed to solve the banking crisis and so forth, and all of a sudden it became okay to spend money. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, 1934 to 1936, those were some of the strongest years ever for the stock market. And unemployment did come down a lot. Now, the problem is it came down from like 25% to 15%. Well, 15% is still you know painfully high, but it was a, a big move in the right direction. So he, he describes how the narrative flipped from don't spend money, it's poor form to yeah, go spend money and help the economy. None of that is taught in, in business school. It's not taught in economics. It can be modeled using this epidemiology model but it doesn't fit into any of the standard uh, macroeconomic models, but it's powerful stuff. And so today what's going on is that the White House is trying to push a narrative and they're failing badly, but they'll say, if you listen to deliberations among White House officials, you know, some of the stuff leaks to the press and some, I know some of these people, it's like the economy's great, unemployment's really low. Um, it, it's, we've created all these jobs since the pandemic but we're doing a really bad job of messaging. The point is they're inside the White House, they're frustrated that the positive economic story is not getting out. The, the correct analysis is that there is no positive economic story. The economy is in terrible shape. The problem is not the messaging, it's the message. Uh, you've, and this is why I say the propaganda from the White House of things are great is at odds with the reality, which is things are not great. Let me give you some specific data points, because as I say, I don't like to make statements like this without backing it up. Number one, the inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, the, if everything was great until February 27th and then Russia invades and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This, this inflation goes back to... Uh, late 2021 it was persistent in the fall we all remember the fed and the treasury saying transitory 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 and then finally i think jay powell was testifying before congress he said it's time to retire the word transitory so that was his way of throwing in the towel and janet yellen admitted she was mistaken also um so it predates the war number one number two oh gee energy prices are going up because there's a war with russia well uh i wonder why that is well the reason uh, it's not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. Then uh, ended new leasing, uh, oil and gas exploration leasing of federal lands, handicapped the fracking industry, took a number of other steps using environmental tools, climate alarm, government subsidies, et cetera, to basically, to the extent possible, shut down the U.S. energy industry as much as possible. Now, you can't shut down completely, of course, but everything happens at the margin. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from $40 to $120 in, in under a year, which is comparable to what happened in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. And then Biden wakes up and says, huh, 
I guess we need more oil. And uh, he, so he wants to reopen leasing. I said, we shut it down. They did, but he wants to reopen it. He's begging Saudi Arabia to pump more. Saudi Arabia is kind of not returning his phone calls. He's begging Venezuela to pump more. Oh, great. The greatest pariah dictator in the Western Hemisphere. And we're begging him for oil. So why don't we drill our own oil? Because uh, we were a net exporter up until 2021. And then Biden came in and we lost that edge and became a net importer, including recently buying oil from Russia. They curtailed that for political reasons, but that's kind of where we got to. Uh, so you wonder why the price of energy is going up. In other words, this damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and the inflation in the US has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It, it won't happen. I could, we don't have time to go through all the physics of it. Uh, and, you know, output of energy by weight, com gasoline compared to batteries and the pollution of batteries and the fact that, you, you know, you, you got to, we don't have the charging stations. And even if we did, where's that electricity coming from? Oh, coal. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. Another example of propaganda versus reality. You know, narratives are pow powerful, but reality is more powerful. So now back to the BRICS, they yeah. replicated the World Bank, they replicated the IMF. Now they're coming out with a new currency. BRICS currency. Now here's where, here's where it gets really interesting. And I tell people, I said, if you want to understand this, uh, it took me a long time to figure this out. I mean, I was just like slaving over it. But I said, if you want to understand this, you have to stop thinking like an American. You have to start thinking like a Russian. This is the kind of thing that pretty much only Russia could come up with. So what is the BRICS currency? And by the way, I don't know if they're going to call it a BRIC. I'm saying BRIC for convenience. It doesn't matter what they call it, but I just call it a BRIC for the time being. But they'll, they'll come up with a name. Who knows? The value of the BRIC is not determined with reference to any other currency. It's determined with reference to gold by weight of gold. And I don't know the weight, they'll pick one, but again, it doesn't matter because now we're back to Aristotle's transit of law. And this is the key. This unlocks the whole thing because Aristotle said, you know, if A equals B equals C, then A equals C, the B can drop out. It's not even arithmetic, it's it's logic. It's called the transit of law. I'm, I'm certain that Aristotle invented it. If any Greek scholars know an earlier source, let me know. So what the BRICS have done is they have dodged the biggest bullet, the thing that caused Bretton Woods ultimately to fail, the thing that potentially stands in the way of all this. They've defined their currency by weight of gold. Now, a weight of gold has a dollar value, right? So. A equals B equals C. One brick equals one, could be an ounce or a kilo, it doesn't matter. Call it an ounce. One brick equals one ounce of gold equals today, 1970. Well, through the transit of law, drop out the B and one brick equals 1970, $1,970. But that's constant. I mean, that logic works for a moment in time, but it's not fixed because the price of gold is going to fluctuate daily, minute by minute, right? So what's going to happen is the dollar gold call it exchange rate, the dollar price of gold. So the LBMA, the COMEX, the London Metals Exchange, you know, JP Morgan on allocated forward contracts, the whole huge gold market in dollars is still going to exist. In fact, uh, the BRICS want it to exist. And if, if I could just digress for one minute, I've never seen an international monetary economic problem that has created more confusion. I won't say misinformation, that's a little try, but just confusion or maybe deliberate hyperbole than this one. Because let me tell you what this is not. I'm going to tell you what it is, but it's important to know what it's not. This is not the petro yuan. This is not the petro ruble. This is not a gold back yuan. This is not a gold standard. This is not the end of the US dollar. It's not the end of the euro. It's not the end of the world. It's not any of those things, but that's what everyone's running around on websites or whatever, shouting, it's none of those things. In fact, quite the opposite. And this is where the Russian mentality comes in. The BRICS want the dollar to be around. 
They want the dollar gold market to exist because they get to free ride. The dollar has to do all the dirty work in the gold space and bricks get the free ride. By declaring one brick equal to a weight of gold, again, weight's the key, they just let the dollar gold market go wherever it goes and the brick is worth an ounce or whatever, kilo, whatever. And uh, yeah, the dollar equivalent under the transit of law changes, but they're not pegged to the dollar. They're not fighting that fight. In other words, the bricks get to free ride on the dollar gold system and they want that system they don't want it to go away because they get the benefit of a gold value now think of what the bricks don't have to do in this scenario they don't have to buy gold they don't even have to own gold they do but no one in the world has enough gold to back a currency this currency the brick will not be redeemable into gold now maybe there's a dealer somewhere who will take it that's between you and, and the dealer but it's not like you're gonna be able to march down to the People's Bank of China with a pile of bricks and say, give me the gold. They're not gonna do it. So it's not redeemable. They're not gonna make a market. They're not gonna maintain a value because they don't have to, because it's by weight. They just get to sit back and piggyback on the dollar gold system and let the dollar do all the dirty work with one twist. And this is, here's the Russian contribution. So you don't have to close your capital account, you can close it, open it, whatever. You don't have to buy gold, you don't have to make a market. You don't, you don't even need that much gold. You just say, this is the ultimate fiat currency. The word fiat in Latin means I say so. Well, they, they say so, and there it is. Basically, this is a bet. This is a bet that the dollar is going to collapse against gold over time, over time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good bet. This is not a three month forecast. I'm not saying gold is going to go up or down in the next week, who knows, but over time, now we're into what? Debt to GDP ratios, annual deficits, uh, dare I say, modern monetary theory. I mean, all the all these ideas are ruining the dollar and everyone can see it, but not yet. And so if you want to launch this new currency and you say, hey, long term, the dollar is going to collapse in terms of gold, I'll hook my horse to this wagon called gold by weight and I'll just reap the benefits and I don't have to do a thing. And so that you're defining it by weight. So you, you know, the, the dollar gold market goes where it goes, but you don't really have to worry about it because you're you're anchored to weight. But here's here's the twist. Uh, and this is how it's going to play out. Now you're in the United States. So you're like, looks like I've been painted into a corner. What can I do? Well, one of the things you could do, I've told the treasury this for years, they don't listen. I mean, they invite me in, but they don't listen. One of the things you could do is buy gold. But what happens when the United States buys gold? The dollar price of gold goes up and the brick gets stronger and the dollar gets weaker. Checkmate. In other words, the US is now in a box where you can't even get out of it by buying gold because you're gonna you're gonna weaken your own currency relative to gold in the process and the bricks are just gonna sit there and not lift a finger. So it's genius. I, I gotta credit the Russians. I'm not saying the Chinese couldn't think of something like this, but this has got Russia's fingerprints all over it. Okay, people have been talking about this for 20 years. You know, the great reset, uh, the end of the dollar, the collapse of the dollar, gold to the moon, et cetera. And it's never played out. And the reason, or some of the ones, which is the dollar has these huge embedded advantages in the form of its reserve currency status, not because everyone loves the dollar or they even love the United States, but because we have the only uh, bond market big enough to absorb global savings. The U.S. Treasury market is huge. It is liquid, but it's got a whole infrastructure Uh Primary dealers that bid at auction, uh, when issue trading, settlement, clearance, futures hedging, options hedging, uh, depository trust corporation, settlement, on and on and on. It's got this huge infrastructure of you know, laws, rules and regulations that they've been building for a long time. I would say 200, um, you know, 37 years since Alexander Hamilton. But above all, it has the rule of law that people just trust it. Don't have to like the dollar, don't have to like the United States, but you trust the market. The U.S., in response to the war in Ukraine, broke the trust. They froze the U.S. Treasury assets of the Central Bank of Russia. Unprecedented. And I'm, I'm a sanctions expert. I work for the intelligence community. It was part of what I did was, you know, look at sanctions and, and CFIUS and, and a lot else. And as far as I'm concerned, I think I know that our BRICS friends agree, that's a default. You know, maybe S&P would call it a selective default. But Russia made the money. They bought the treasuries they're entitled to principal and interest and we're saying no you can't have the principal and interest we're not paying you well that's a default i don't care how janet yellow wants to dress it up and it was a shock but worse than that everyone else in the world was watching saudi arabia india 
Brazil, Malaysia, and they're saying, and Turkey, and, and others, and they're saying to themselves, what if the United States doesn't like what I did? What if they don't like my policy? Are they going to freeze my treasuries? Well, until a year ago, you would say, well, of course not. They would never do that. Well, they did in the case of Russia, and they will uh, potentially in the case of these other countries. So that was the catalyst. The idea of getting out under the dollar, yeah, it's been around a long time. The feasibility of that was limited, capped really, by the absence of a bond market big enough to absorb global savings. But now the countries are saying, well, what good is it to have my savings in treasuries if you're just going to steal them? So I'll, maybe, I'm not saying BRICS are wonderful all out of the out of the gate, but at least it's not dollars, at least it's not maintained on a digital ledger at the U.S. Treasury, and at least you can't steal it. And so that was the catalyst that drove this thing from a 17-year project to, hey, warp speed, let's get it yeah. done, how do we do it, and there we are. I'm going to spend $50 billion to create 51% of the mining capacity in the world, and I'm going to steal all the Bitcoin in the world and take down the Western financial system. First of all, there's no such thing as cryptocurrency. There are a thousand cryptocurrencies. In other words, you cannot speak generically about cryptocurrencies. These people, Jim Rickards hates cryptocurrencies. That's not true. I really, really dislike Bitcoin, and I'll tell you why. But there are cryptocurrencies out there that I think are very interesting and, and worth uh, your consideration. Um, I'm for it. I'm against it. Cryptocurrency is, means nothing. You have to talk about the specific currency. And I'm, uh, and I'm here, I'm showing uh, Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Monero, and Ether. By the way, isn't it fascinating how the graphical representation of cryptocurrencies is always a gold or silver coin? Um, you know, Bitcoin's gold and Litecoin's silver, Monero's both, and Ether is, is gold. I mean, what are they trying to say? I think that psychologically what they're saying is, well, this is, this is nothing, but if we pretend, if we pretend it's a gold coin, then someone will buy it. Uh, but I, I just find this a little bit of an aside. But no, it's the same thing is true with fiat currencies. You can't be uh, like or dislike fiat currencies generically. Some people do because they just hate central banks. I understand that. But it's a big difference between a, uh, a, a Venezuelan Bolivar and, uh, Bolivar and a, a euro. Big difference between a Zimbabwe dollar and a U.S. dollar. So in other words, don't talk to me about cryptocurrencies. Tell me what specific one you want to talk about, and that's a more interesting conversation. I think it's really important because this, this field is so muddied, the conversation is so muddied, people not distinguishing between blockchain and currency, not, not distinguishing between different types of currencies, et cetera. I think we need to step back, take a deep breath, and be rigorous in our analysis and think about what we're actually talking about. There's no such thing as a blockchain. There are hundreds of blockchains. In other words, every currency, every token, every um, so-called smart contract, if you're using Ether, has a different blockchain. So there are at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of blockchains, new ones being created every day. So again, don't talk to me about blockchain. Tell me which specific blockchain you're talking about because they're not all the same. And this is critical. The main difference, there are, there are many differences in this blockchain technology, but the main difference is validation. Because remember, the whole idea, the whole idea uh, of cryptocurrencies and blockchain and the original Bitcoin and what Satoshi Nakamoto came up with is that we're not, we're going to have a trustless system. We're not going to trust banks. We're not going to trust clearing houses. We're not going to trust exchanges. We're not going to trust central banks. We're not going to trust anybody. We're going to have a decentralized system that a community can validate, and we don't have to rely on anybody in particular. That was the original idea. So the question is, what's your method of validation? And that's what distinguishes one blockchain from the other. So there's, there, I've listed four of them here, but there are others. Proof of work, that's what blockchain uses. And you know what the work is? You gotta like factor these, you know, uh, 87 digit uh, prime numbers uh, into or numbers into prime factors. Uh, it's a lot of computer crunching, completely clunky, completely inefficient, non sustainable. I'll talk about that in a second. But that's Bitcoin. There's something else called proof of stake, meaning you actually, this is what Ether is based on. You demonstrate that you have a certain percentage of the processing power, so you step up based on your stake. There's proof of space. Uh, space is storage space on a hard drive, so I get to vote on. The blockchain, I get to vote on validating the blockchain because I've decided to devote a certain amount of my hard drive to that process. That's, there's a new coin called Spacement. Uh, and then there's the Byzantine Agreement, or Byzantine Agreement. Um, there's something, there's a version of that called the Federated Byzantine Agreement, uh, which uh, I uh, personally uh, think is the best um, 
much more, uh, uh, much more robust than some of the problems we're talking about, and there are others. But the point is, don't talk about blockchain. Say, okay, what's your, what's your governance model? What's your validation model, uh, et cetera? And then, and then ask yourself, is that sustainable? Is that robust? Will that resist an attack? Are your, are your cryptocurrencies going to be stolen? These are the questions you have to ask yourself, and there are no generic answers. So I, I cannot emphasize enough. Coin by coin, I hate to use the word coin, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> token by token, uh, blockchain by blockchain, be rigorous and ask yourself what's sustainable. Now, um, Bitcoin, Ripple, and Ether, and some of these other cryptocurrencies, not all of them, not all of them, but the, but the best known are going to fail. When I say fail, they're going to, you know, Bitcoin might have a, um, a $200 value as a uh, token for criminals, and criminals and terrorists might, might find a, a, a use case at about $200 per Bitcoin, but they're basically not going to be anywhere ne near where they are today. Why do I say that? I don't want to make a claim without backing it up. The first point is they're non-scalable. Transaction times are slow, uh, and then when you say that to Bitcoin people, they go, aha, the Lightning Network is right around the corner. You know, Lightning's going to, we'll see. You know, they said that about Segregated Witness. They said that about some of these other solutions. They, they don't seem to get community support. They keep forking the Bitcoin, meaning one day you wake up and there's two blockchains instead of one, or whatever happened to that whole idea that we weren't going to have inflation, that we weren't going to pull new cryptos out of thin air. But um, these solutions, you have to understand what the solution is. So what they're saying is nobody has a solution for the inherent slowness, clunkiness, non-scalability of the original Bitcoin blockchain. There's no solution for that. So when you hear about solutions, what are they? Well, what they're saying is take a bunch of transactions offline. So everybody in the room could form a group or let's say every, every coffee shop in Brooklyn, New York, or every coffee shop in Vancouver could form a group. And all the people who want to buy coffee would join that group. And we would agree, so we're in our own little bubble over here, and we would agree that all of our Bitcoin transactions uh, among each other are, don't go on the blockchain. They just get settled in this sort of separate cloud over here. And then we net them out. So, you know, I pay you five Bitcoin, and you pay the person next to you four, and he pays the lady in the back of the room ten, and she pays me seven. And we add all, we net it out, and then periodically, and it could be daily, weekly, monthly, or whatever, we net all this stuff out, and then we take that net and we put that on the blockchain. So that the amount of transactions that have to go on the blockchain is greatly reduced, that's true. But what are, what are we doing? We've created our own network. I gotta trust the coffee shops. How do I know they're not gonna steal my money? In other words, it's only a solution because you're completely negating the original idea. Well, I'll be sure, if you want to, if you want to tear, up the, tear up the original idea and start over, that's fine, but don't tell me you're adhering to the idea of a decentralized trustless network because you're not. All you've done is create another network. Somebody, uh, you know, I get trolled on Twitter all the time. People tell me I'm an idiot and I don't know technology and all that stuff. And then my more sour moods, I tell them I was coding uh, before they were born. But uh, as, far as, uh, as far as some of these, um, these things are concerned, uh, somebody said, well, you don't understand payment channels. And uh, I actually do. And I said, yeah, I understand payment channels. Uh, we, we had those in the 50s. They were called party lines, we, which is, you know, you pick up the phone and someone's talking. You've got to ask them to get off the phone so you could go. In other words, there was an AT&T network, at least in the United States, but other people could jump in on this little side thing. You know, that's all it is. These are party lines. So uh, that, that doesn't work. Non-sustainable. The energy usage to do, to solve the problem and make the proof of work in Bitcoin is now greater than the annual energy output of Ireland. Imagine taking all the electricity used in Ireland in a year, and that's how much we have to use to, to crunch numbers. By the way, every applied mathematician will tell you that prime factoring is a trivial problem. It it's like an uninteresting, not a, uninteresting problem. But it takes a lot of computing power to do it because the numbers are so big and the possibilities are so great. So we're just wasting the entire electrical usage of Ireland. In a few years, it's going to be the entire electrical usage of Japan. Who thinks, who in this room thinks that governments are going to allow Bitcoin miners to use as much electricity in a year as the entire country of Japan, the third largest economy in the world? That's not going to happen. It's, you know it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not very green. It's not very, it's completely wasteful. In other words, it, it, can't, it can't happen. So that's why I say it's not sustainable. It's going to hit a wall. Non-regulated, you know, I don't have to remind you of all the frauds, new ones popping up every day. Um, 
And it's not just exchanges. Uh, exchanges are, how do exchanges work? Well, you know, you, I'm gonna go to a Bitcoin exchange. Well, you gotta go and you gotta open an account, just like Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab, right? So, uh, you know, or, 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 or Toronto Dominion. So you go, you give me your name, your address, your social security number, your bank wire information, give them all that information, and then send them dollars, and they say, okay, you got some Bitcoin, here's your confirmation. Really, how do I know you didn't just take my dollars and send me a phony baloney confirmation? How do I know you're not um, you know, a, a Ponzi? You're using new money to pay off the old money. How do I know you're not Bernie Madoff in, uh, you know, with, a, with a computer engineering degree? Uh, how do I know you're not a bucket shop? How do I know any of those things? The answer is you don't. Uh, so good luck with that. Uh, not to mention Bitcoin whales. They, they estimate there are 1,000 people who control 40% of the Bitcoin. Now you got millennials buying, you know, one one hundredth of a bitcoin for, you know, ten bucks or whatever the math is, hundred bucks. Uh, but you got these, I call them the whales, these thousand people who have forty percent of all the bitcoin. You don't think they have a big vested interest in keeping the price up, and you don't think they wash trade, do wash sales. So A sells to B for ten thousand, B sells back for eleven thousand, A sells back for twelve thousand, B sells back for thirteen thousand. This is called painting the tape. It's the oldest trick in the book. Um, and there's no profit loss because we're selling the same Bitcoin back and forth. But what we are doing is creating a ticker that gets the millennials, I shouldn't pick up millennials, three millennial children, but gets uh, people all over the world, maybe a, a garage mechanic in South Korea took out a home equity loan or hocked his inventory, put his entire life savings into Bitcoin and has now been wiped out and is desperate and is suicidal. That's what's going on. It's basically rich people stealing from the poor. Uh, not a good business model in my view. And then finally, uh, there's no use case other than the criminals, terrorists, or tax evaders. Why is Bitcoin better than Visa unless you're a criminal? Now, if you're a criminal, I get it. If you're buying child pornography, uh, you want to use the dark web and use some cryptos and all that. And if you try doing that with Visa, you'll probably get a call from the FBI. So I understand why it's good for criminals. But if you're not a criminal, if you're not a tax evader, if you're not buying child pornography, if you're not an arms dealer, if you're not a terrorist, then why is Bitcoin better than Visa? Um, there's really no use case for it other than crime. Um, and then it's non elastic. And this is uh, important because there's a finite number of Bitcoins, 21 million Bitcoin. They're getting closer to that level every day. When, and everyone's like, this is a good thing because, you know, the problem with central banks is they print all this money and we're going to have inflation. By the way, we haven't had any inflation for the last eight years. Separate issue. I'll come to that if we don't run out of time. But, um, uh, you know, we hate central banks. They print too much money, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to cap the number of Bitcoin, but, but, but money supply has to be elastic. It can't be too elastic. The problem with central bank money is that it's too elastic, too elastic. The reason, by the way, gold is such a good form of money is that it grows slowly. It grows at about the tempo of world growth. It grows at about the tempo of population growth. Not exactly, but close enough that it's the best form of money anyone's ever discovered. But the problem with Bitcoin, when you hit a hard stop, which they will, and the economy keeps growing, but you want to back it with Bitcoin, so here's your money supply and here's your economy, that's inherently deflationary, right? Because each Bitcoin's got to support more and more growth, meaning your Bitcoin is worth more in theory. But the problem is you never get there. Why? Because if you have a deflationary currency, there's no bond market. The money supply grows based on credit, based on loans, based on various forms of borrowing. The money supply is just a foundation and, the, and the, the, the economy grows with credit. Nobody wants to borrow in a form of money that's gonna be more expensive when you pay it back. I'm not talking about interest. That's always part of the equation. I'm saying the money itself is, um, is worth more when you have to pay back the loan. No one's gonna borrow on that loan, therefore no bond market, therefore no viable form of money. So these are all the reasons why this is gonna hit the wall. Uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening uh, on top of a world where growth is deaccelerating, inventories are sky high. You know the funny thing about the supply chain. You know we all remember headline: your know, supply chain is broken down. Uh, you know the, the shelves are bare. So all true that that was happening at the time, and that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did, um, and inventory managers, they, they doubled their orders. They said, well, or tripled the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down and I want just a normal amount, I better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what I want. And they did. Well, what happened was by the summer, some of that pressure had been alleviated. And here come the shipments into the warehouses 
that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the Fed was destroying demand. And so demand drops off a cliff, uh, retail sales drop off a cliff, the warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters, and now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what do, what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, you don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like, who wants to buy, you know, a summer dress in uh, December? And not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices. Uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that. Uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness, the, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which uh, is is not a good measure of, um, of what's going on in the labor force. So we're flying into a really bad recession. But, you know, you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of the Some of the buy the dips people are still around. So count on them to, you know, buy into uh, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd, you know, remember in uh, 2000, 2001, the NASDAQ dropped 80%. And a lot of people got out, but a lot of, they said, well, just hold on to it. Well, it did come back, but it took until 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime, you know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the, the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake-up call and have to cut rates. And cutting rates, that's the pivot. You know, they're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks, so buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. There are two huge fallacies in that uh, in that narrative. The first one is, uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates. We're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've, I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did. Um, and he meant it. Um, he knows there's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, Unemployment's going to go up. He said that. He tied unemployment to um, killing, you know, basically demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said, we're, that's how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to you know, get a wake-up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food, and that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that Let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. Now, what Pal, which is their target, so what Pal said is, we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive or restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's that he said that might last for a year, all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now again, this, this can change, but but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say forecasting the Fed is the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now the hard part is understanding how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis. But telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. So so the stock market notion that somehow they'll be cutting rates is just false. And but the second fallacy is even bigger is tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and Growth is going to come down, inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Bear market rallies are, are really interesting. Some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything. But for a couple of days or weeks even, uh, uh, it's, hey, the bottom's in, you buy stocks, et cetera. So you have, you have to watch out for that. So, so my expectation is the recession's coming. It's going to be really bad. Um, inflation is going to come down fast, but not quite fast enough for the Fed. 
Uh, they're going to keep raising rates, destroying demand, raising unemployment. And we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. I, uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours. Actually, you know, I was you know I was in the room with the Treasury and Italian Finance Ministry and 19 banks and you know a thundering herd of lawyers trying to trying to save the world. But uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. There was a four billion dollar all cash. You know, you could you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time. It was just hey, the Fed wants us to do this, so let's just do it. Um, so uh, so that worked. But um, it was it was you know it was a very close call. They would have shut down Tokyo and then around the world, London and finally New York. And you know they would have opened days later. But that's how uh, with trillions of dollars of losses, it would have been worse than what actually happened in in 2008. It didn't happen. But there was no economic recession at the time. That was and that's that confuses a lot of people because and particularly if you're if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference. There are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now, NASDAQ collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in NASDAQ. There was, there was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't, no banks, no banks failed, no major brokerages failed, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. Uh, October 19, 1987, interesting, stock market fell 22% in one day not a week or a month, but one day down 22%. And that was a financial crisis, but there was no, there was no recession. Uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together. And 2008 was an example. There we had both, but I would encourage analysts to separate those two things. Again, they came together, it was, it was horrific, but, um, but they can happen separately. My, my point is we may have um, a very bad recession, possibly worse than 2008. But 2008 is a model, and that may be what we're heading for, bearing in mind that these are two separate vectors. I would say that the Fed may actually cut rates sooner than sooner than Michael Wilson expects, and maybe sooner than a lot of Wall Street expects. Uh, and you say, well, Jim, isn't that good for stocks? And the answer is no, because the reason they're gonna cut rates is because things are gonna be much worse than even Wilson and others expect, which is gonna cause the economy to crash. And then you will pivot, not because you want to, but because inflation might be zero, it could be negative. We, you, we could actually be into deflation. We're already in disinflation. Disinflation is when you still have inflation that's coming down. That's disinflation, it's still coming, you still have inflation, but it's coming down. Deflation is when prices actually go down. In inflation is negative. It's not a question of going up at a slower rate, it's a question of actually going down. And then that feeds on itself. That's the central banker's worst nightmare because people say, why should I buy anything? I'll just, I'll just sit my money and wait for the price to come down, maybe buy six months from now or maybe wait a year. And then that feeds on itself. And then unemployment goes up, businesses shut down, stock markets crash, you know, et cetera. And the Fed pretty quickly turns around and cuts rates. Now, we've actually seen this movie, uh, and it wasn't that long ago. Go back to uh, 2015, December 2015. That was the famous liftoff. Remember, interest rates had been at zero, I believe, for six, six and a half years at that point, the zero interest rate policy. And then Janet Yellen raises interest rates 25 basis points. Okay, it was a baby step, but at least they went up for the first time in six or seven years. And it actually was longer than that because they they were at zero for they were at zero for six years, but there was a series of cuts to get to zero. So the last time they had raised rates was even further back. That was like 2006. So uh, so that was a uh, more like nine years. So she raises interest rates 25 basis points and then waits a year. The next rate hike was December 2016. They waited a whole year just to go 25 basis points more, almost as if they would have been embarrassed if they had done nothing in all of 2016. I think it was the only reason they did it. But then when Powell came in in, in 2017, 
that tempo picked up. It was like kind of nothing burger for a year and a half. But then Powell's like, boom, 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 you know, 25 basis point hikes and got the rate all the way up to two and a half, which doesn't sound like a lot, but considering that they had been at zero for six years, that was that was pretty steep. But what happened between October 1st and December 24th, 2018? The stock market collapsed. I mean, the uh, the Dow Jones, the S&P, uh, and the NASDAQ all fell about 20% just short of a bear market. It was like 19.8%, you know, 20% to all intents and purposes. But that was in less than three months. And the Fed kept raising rates in the middle of the stock market crash. This shows you how out of touch they are and how behind the curve they are. So the last rate hike was December uh, 14th or 15th. They got to look at the calendar. It was, it was right, right around the middle of December, 14th or 15th. Even after two months of crashing stock prices, they raised rates one last time. They just kept going and kind of what we, were what we were talking about earlier. And then finally on December 24th, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre, the NASDAQ fell 3% in one day. The Dow was like about 1.8%, S&P was over two and, and the NASDAQ was 3%. And then the, the Fed got religion, like, oh, we went too far. Uh, we're the last to know as always. So early January, 2019, Powell said, use the word patient. It's one of those code words. It means patient means we're not going to raise rates unless we tell you. So they were on pause. And then by late 2019, they cut rates. And then along came COVID. And by March 2020, they were back to zero. You had this huge round trip from zero in November 2015 to about two and a quarter, two and a half in DC 2018 back down to zero by March, 2020. Like, what was that all about? Well, the Fed went too far, didn't know what they were doing. The economy was weaker than they expected and they raised rates. So, so bring that scenario forward to today. I feel like I'm watching the same movie, which is, okay, the Fed's they got the gumption, they raised rates, raised rates, raised rates. Now they're much higher than they were in 2018, but they're flying into a hurricane. They're flying into a very weak economy seen by a lot of metrics, housing stars, global trade, the ISM surveys, industrial output, inventories. There's, just, there's tons of negative data. It's not the kind of thing that people doesn't make their headlines the way CPI does, but it's all there. It's hard data. So it looks like a bigger, better version of what happened in 2018. And I would expect a worse outcome. So my point is the Fed may in fact rate, sorry, the Fed may in fact cut rates sooner than Wall Street expects, sooner than Michael Wilson expects, but not for good reasons, but for very bad reasons, because we're in a severe recession. So, so the bottom line is we've had the supply side inflation. Now, we have not seen it come from the demand side, but let's say you're the Fed, okay? All you want to do is get inflation under control. You kind of don't care where it's coming from. You just want to get it down to 2%. So then the question is, okay, how, how is the Fed doing at getting inflation to the target? The, the 2% we talked about and explain why that's their number. The answer is they're making progress, but they're not there yet. And he's, and this says a lot about what's going on in the stock market right now, because you go all the way back to August 26, 2022. That was Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. And he said, inflation's, you know, not, he didn't use the word out of control, but he said inflation's way too high. We're going to bring it down to our 2% target. We know unemployment's going to go up. We know he will probably have recession. He did not use the R word. He didn't say recession, but he said, you know, growth will suffer, unemployment will go up. That's just a fancy way of saying there's going to be a recession. And we're not going to stop until we get there. And so in other words, too bad, you know. Well, the Fed has no tools to affect the supply side. The Fed doesn't drive trucks. They don't drill for oil. They don't plant crops. They don't run tractors. They don't do anything that could alleviate the, su the supply side problems. All the Fed can do is destroy demand, and that they can do. When you raise interest rates enough, mortgage rates go up, credit card rates go up, you know, cost of working capital go up. All that tends to slow the economy, and it causes people to tighten their belts. But just think of the conundrum. The, the inflation is coming from the supply side. The Fed can't do anything about the supply side, but they can crush demand, which should reduce inflation. But how much do you have to crush demand when that's not the problem? It's coming from the supply side. How much demand do you have to destroy to actually affect the supply side? The answer is a lot. And this is what Jay Powell has been saying. Unemployment has to go up. We're, we're, we're going to be in a recession. We've got to crush this thing 
before it gets out of control. And you got to crush it even more because that's not even where the inflation is coming from. It's coming from the supply side. Supply chain bottlenecks have been alleviated to some extent, not not completely by any means. And it was always a case of popping up here and there. You know, it's not like you went into a supermarket and all the shelves were bare. It wasn't East Germany in the 1950s, but something would be missing. You know, it could be the peanut butter one day or the, the canned goods and extra spaghetti the week after that. That has uh, alleviated to some extent, not, not completely. But again, the reason it has been alleviated is a very bad one which is that demand is down. In other words, the Fed is destroying demand, so people are buying less. So, you know, grocers and retailers and boutiques and suppliers are able to keep more things on the shelf, not because all the logistics problems have been solved, but because the demand is down, because that's what the Fed's doing. So supply chain better, yes, but for good reasons or bad reasons? Well, it's for bad reasons because demand is down. And that's another thing leading us into a recession. So a, a couple of things we should probably, without taking too much for granted, we should probably just define BRICS. It's an acronym, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So those are the BRICS. And it started in 2002 as a Goldman Sachs marketing gimmick. Uh, Jim O'Neill and some partners came up with it. Uh, and all they did, I'm not, I'm not diminishing what they did, but they kind of took the leading economies, took out the G7 and Switzerland and a couple of obvious leaders and said, well, who's left? Uh, that will be the up and comers, the fastest growing developing economies. Then they got Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That was kind of easy. And then a few years later, they added South Africa, uh, which was a little bit of a favorite of South Africa. South Africa is not anywhere near as large as those other economies or as important. However, it is one of the biggest economies in Africa. And if you're going to do, if you're going to be the BRICS, you probably can't just be South America and Asia. You probably need to include an African country. So they picked South Africa. So for a couple of years, it was a Goldman marketing brochure. But then in 2006, at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, annual meeting, you know, heads of state and foreign ministers show up from all over the world, but they have what they call these bilateral meetings on the sidelines. And sometimes there are three or four say, hey, we're all here, let's just grab a conference room and sit down and talk. Well, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, um, they sat down and they said, yeah, we actually have a lot in common, a lot to talk about, and we added it up, we're, we're a pretty powerful group. So they formalized it. And then in 2009, they had a summit conference, a formal summit conference with an agenda and all that in uh, Ekaterinburg in Russia, in the Russian Federation. And they, they solidified, okay, we're a group, we're gonna work together, and they did. And over the coming years, they, they multiplied numerous, numerous. People say it's the BRICS meeting. They have about 190 meetings a year. They have working groups on uh, women's rights, uh, sports, the environment, climate change, you know, it could go on and on. It's a very active, what they call secretariat, which is, you know, central organization. A few years later, in 2014, they formed what they called the New Development Bank, NDB. Well, what's the New Development Bank? First of all, it's got 100 billion of capital, part paid in, part callable, uh, but it also has borrowing power with that kind of ownership and that kind of capital on the balance sheet. They've got hundreds of billions of dollars of borrowing power. They could easily get a, a, a pretty good credit rating. Uh, and the, the purpose is to make loans for development projects to the member countries. And by the way, there are stockholders of the New Development Bank who are not BRICS, but they're kind of in the club. Well, what does that sound like? The World Bank on their own terms with their own governance. Okay, the following year, they created something called the Contingent Reserve Arrangement. Well, what's that? Again, they threw in a couple hundred billion dollars from the members, China was the biggest contributor. Again, with borrowing power, so take a couple hundred billion times five or 10, you're, that's, that's your power. And this institution was designed to be a swing lender to members who were running a trade deficits or facing a run on their currency or facing the prospect of having to close the capital account. Exactly what we saw in 1997, 98, by the way, I was, I was there for that one. We ended up with long-term capital. Well, a pool that is a swing lender to countries with a balance of payments deficit, what does that sound like? That's the IMF. So basically they copy the World Bank, they copy the IMF. And I wanna make two points. Number one, it's not like the BRICS popped up six months ago and said, hey, we're gonna have a new currency. You know, it's like get Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland putting on a play. This has been in the works for 17 years. And it's 
typical Russian Chinese, they're very methodical. So they duplicated the World Bank, they duplicated the IMF. Now they have a applicants for membership and there are, I think, 21 or more countries who have applied for, well, seven have formally applied for membership. They filled out their college essay and they want to be members. And then another 13 or 14 on the waiting list, so to speak, and uh, will perhaps eventually become members. But when you add those in, some of these will be admitted starting with Saudi Arabia. Okay, so what happens when you let Saudi Arabia into the BRICS, <laughs> given the other members? You have two of the three largest oil producers in the world, mm -hmm. Russia and Saudi Arabia. You have two of the three largest nuclear arsenals in the world, Russia and China. You have, you know, throwing India in and some others, you have uh, about 50% of global population, 54% of global GDP using purchasing power parity. That's, you can debate the method, but just if you do purchasing power parity, you get over half of, of G GDP, 30% of the global land mass. I could go on and on. My point is, you know, I did, I learned development economics in the 1970s. We had something called the third world. It was like, it was Russia or, you know, Soviet Union and the U.S. And then there was the third world. And all you knew about them was they were poor and, you know, you had to get them off the runway. That, we actually had a, a, the runway theory of how you'd grow. Turned out to be wrong, but that's what we learned. Well, this is not the old third world. These are not basket cases. These are many of the biggest economies in the world that collectively have enormous power, natural resources, uh, gold reserves, landmass, population, military, and again, I could go down the list, but this is a block that is as powerful in its own way by a lot of these metrics as the collective West, which would, I would call, you know, US, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and a few others. So that's who this group is. Now there are a couple other groups that may join forces with the BRICS. Uh, there's something called the Eurasian Economic Union. And I was like, what the heck is that? Well, this goes back to the, uh, early 2000s. This was Putin's answer to the EU. He said, well, you got the EU, we got the EEU. Now it's Russia and some Central Asian republics, some, you know, Belarus and Tajikistan. I'm not saying this is France, Germany and Italy, but it is a, a group that have reduced tariffs and improved trade between themselves. And there's another powerful group called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization mm -hmm. led by China. And these are mostly Central Asian republics, including uh, Kazakhstan and some others. But but they're all talking to each other. Now, what's the common denominator? Well, it's basically Russia and China. Uh, China's a member of two. Russia is the only country in the world that's a member of all three. So through pretty simple inference, you can say, hey, Russia and China are running the show. And it's very likely that when this thing plays out, and I'll talk about the thing, I realize we're glossing over that, but when, when this new currency plays out, that those other countries will join in. When you do that, and I got I found a really cool widget, it's a map of the world that's blank, and you can go country by country and fill in by color, just you know, click on it and give it a color. And I did that. And I was like, okay, here's the BRICS, it's five countries or whatever. Well, here are the, here are the applicants, it has another 20. And here's the SCO, a few more. Some of them are members of both. Here's the EEU, has a few more. Again, many are members of both. And you keep going. And all of a sudden, like a light bulb goes on. I said, that that is Halford McKinder's global island, the, what he called the world oh. island. And then this goes back early 20th century, first probably greatest geopolitical theorist in history. Got to read his book if you haven't read it, it's pretty short. But he had this idea of, of the world island. That is exactly what they're building. Now, why is that important other than uh, the obvious, which is you know more collective economic and population power? By the way, the output of we pick your metric, they, this dominates the world. Well, for one thing, if you're going to have a currency union, the more countries you have, the more likely you are to be successful. Let's just kind of digress for a second. And what are the headlines saying? China and Saudi Arabia are talking about selling oil for yuan. Brazil and China do large multi-currency deal where they accept each other's currency. UAE, China, same thing, selling oil for yuan. Uh, Russia, China, using yuan and rubles as payment methods for whatever they sell to each other. You know, Russia sells natural resources, China sells semiconductors and manufactured goods and so forth. And there are a number of those, I don't have to list them all, but there are 10 or 15 of these. The reason they've all fallen short, and very few of them have actually come to fruition despite the headlines, is when you have two countries and they're gonna trade with each other and accept each other's currency, and you can do that, you're limited to what you can do with that currency. This is why the Russia-India thing is starting to break down. Russia has been pumping oil to India. India has been paying in rupees 
but how much curry do you need? And Russia's starting to balk. They're like, hey, we, we, we're up to our eyeballs in rupees. Let's, we need a better system. Well, when you have a, a multilateral, multi-country currency union, that problem goes away. Now, Russia sells oil to China. China pays in bricks. The brick currency pays you in brick. But Russia can take the brick and turn around to Argentina and say, we'd like to buy, or Brazil maybe, and we'd like to buy some Embraer aircraft. And Brazil gets the brick currency and they can turn around to China and say, we'd like to buy some rice. And then China takes, et cetera. And so you've solved the quasi-barter problem.